when Orange County Detective Yvonne Schull opened up Linda Curry's cold case file, it began a seven-year journey into the toxic machinations of a consummate liar. Paul was a manipulator and a liar. I'd never interviewed anyone who was such a narcissist and who thought so highly of themselves, who thought they were so smart. And Paul Curry believes that he's smarter than everybody else. It was his demise. Linda was intelligent, driven, and successful. Multiple promotions saw her progress from the role of secretary to management. Linda Curry worked at nuclear generating plant in the education area. She was very well respected, very well uh, known. She was, everyone loved Linda. There, no one would say anything bad about her ever. I never found anybody to say anything bad about her. Enjoying the fruits of her labor, Linda lived well and was famously generous. She was always dressed to the nines, dressed very well. She had a house in San Clemente, California that was even had white carpet and was always super clean and very well. But there was just one thing missing. She had not been married before, but she had long-term boyfriends. From what everybody said, they said, you know, she wanted to be in a relationship. She just wanted someone to love her and to be good to her. In 1989, a new engineer started at the power plant. His name was Paul Curry. He worked as a consultant. He worked for a company called MDM Engineering and he worked at Center for a nuclear generating plant doing mathematic calculations. Linda and Paul met each other at Center for a nuclear generating plant and she was attracted to him because he was smart and well-read and she was attracted to that. Drawn to the confident younger engineer, the couple began dating. It was about a 15-year age difference. She was older than him, so he was a younger man. Her previous boyfriends were all around her age, but Paul was younger, and he was very uh, charismatic with her, and when they were dating, he treated her well, and she just wanted to be loved. Curry appeared to dote on Linda, running her baths and cooking her sumptuous meals. After three years, the couple married in Las Vegas on September the 12th, 1992. But few of those close to Linda shared her joy. They didn't like him. They thought that he was uh, a narcissist, that he thought highly of himself, and that they didn't like him. Linda's family did not really like Paul. Linda's best friend did not like him, uh, and they tried to convince her not to be with him. Paul was not all that he seemed. He was all fake. He didn't really have any college degree, although he said he did. Everything was fake about him. Linda was his fourth marriage, third wife but fourth marriage, because his second wife he married twice. His first wife he married very young, met the second wife when he was a piano player on a cruise ship. Paul had costs arising from his previous marriages. Within weeks of getting married, he brought up the subject of life insurance. Everything was left to him because once they were married, he tried to get her to put everything in his name, change her name, Though concerned about his sudden interest in her life insurance policy, Linda convinced herself Paul loved her. Family told her and her best friend told her to stay away from him. And she said, no, he loves me and I love him and I'm gonna stay with him. What Paul did love 
was Linda's insurance policies. Keen to be in a position to collect on the payouts, Paul elected to poison Linda. His chemical of choice was nicotine. Despite rivaling cyanide and surpassing arsenic in toxicity, the presence of nicotine in an autopsy is not uncommon. I think that Paul Curry was trying to find something that could be used that would not be detected or recognized. Nicotine is present in, in a screening test in so many autopsy toxicology results. And normally it's just ignored because you're a smoker, it's there. Ten months after tying the knot, the usually exuberant Linda became ill. The nicotine affects virtually every part of the body. The first thing you see with poisoning is nausea and vomiting. Your heart rate goes up, you sweat, your skin gets pale because you're constricting blood vessels in the skin. And you get also anxious, anxiety is part of it. The nausea and vomiting we think occur because of the effects on the brain. The sweating because of effects on nerves all over the body. The increase in heart rate because of nerves in the heart. And the seizures because of effects in the brain. An overdose of nicotine causes the brain's neurotransmitters to switch off. Instead of being stimulated, you go into coma. You have seizures, you become paralyzed, and you also paralyze breathing, and so nicotine kills you because you stop breathing. In July 1993, Linda was admitted to San Clemente Hospital. Paul was in visiting with her. This is what the nurse said. The nurse came in and found the IV was cloudy. So they took the IV off immediately. They sent it for testing, but they only tested for heavy metals, not anything else. Police were called to investigate the suspected poisoning and quizzed a recovering Linda. She said in the interview, if I die, Paul is the reason. After spending three weeks in hospital, Linda went home. But six months later, she was gravely ill. The second time, she got sick again. Same scenario, diarrhea, vomiting, nauseousness. She was taken to Mission Hospital in Mission Viejo, a completely different hospital, completely different staff, completely for everything. The only common denominator is Linda and Paul. And again, the IV had been tampered with. And at this time, the IV port was broken and was found by a nurse with an IV port broken. I interviewed that nurse, and I asked her, how many IVs have you done in your career? Tens of thousands was her answer. And she told me she had never, ever seen an IV tampered with in that way ever, except for that time. On June the 9th, 1994, Paul telephoned 911. Linda was unconscious. She was rushed to San Clemente Hospital, but it was too late. Linda was pronounced dead on arrival. and autopsy was completed. The body was released to Paul Curry, which he immediately had it cremated. A report from toxicology found Linda had both Zolpidem, a sleeping pill, and nicotine in her system, even though she wasn't a smoker. Paul Curry was a prime suspect for her death, but police struggled to prove it. They were looking at the more volatile, um, when really they should look at quantitatively. They were focusing on their own poison to start with, and they couldn't prove that Paul Curry had access to that poison, so they couldn't prove that he was a suspect, even though in their mind he was a suspect, but they couldn't prove anything. Throwing police a red herring, Curry seemed to have got away with murder. Paul got her life insurance policies, 
got her retirement at Southern California Edison, and he was receiving retirement checks every single month from the time that she died up until the time I arrested him. So he was getting about $500 a month from Edison. But Curry didn't have everything his own way. Before Linda died, she actually changed the beneficiary on some of her life insurance to her sister and wrote to her sister and said, this is what I want done with my money, with my life insurance, with et cetera. And she changed some of that stuff without Paul's knowledge. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. The case eventually went cold. Eight years later, Sergeant Shull came across the file. Well, I requested to go work in the cold case unit at the time. So the Curry case, I started looking at and started listening to the interviews. And one of the interviews that I listened to was an interview of Linda Curry prior to her death, where she said in the interview, if I die, Paul is the reason. And so I knew at that time that I, it was a good case to work on. Working a cold case, everybody is in a different spot than they were seven years ago or five years ago. So people were all over the country. So I had to do a lot of traveling to see people and talk to people. And finding people was difficult. Shell located Linda's sister and flew to Arizona to meet her. She basically told me at the end of the interview, well, I'll never see you again. She felt that nobody was going to work on the case and that it was an exercise in futility to talk to me. And she said, well, I don't think this is ever going to be solved because nobody cares. This cold case team did. They re-examined the autopsy results. When I came to the case, I looked at it first of all and say, okay, what poison killed her? No one seemed to have queried the levels of nicotine in Linda's body. So Shull contacted one of the world's most eminent nicotine experts, Dr. Neil Benowitz in San Francisco to find out more. We found two things that were quite remarkable. <clears throat> The first is that the nicotine levels were in the blood were phenomenally high. Normally, if a smoker smokes a cigarette, the levels might be 20 or 30 nanograms per milliliter. In the blood of Linda Curry, nicotine levels that we measured were 1,100 nanograms per milliliter. It was the highest level of nicotine his team had recorded in any context. Dr. Benowitz then examined the levels of a byproduct of nicotine called cotinine. In a smoker, cotinine levels are typically 10 times higher than nicotine levels. In this case, what we found was that the nicotine levels were 1,100 and the cotinine levels were only 300. So, very low cotinine levels with very high nicotine levels. What that means is that there was not enough time that the nicotine was in the body to be converted to codeine. The only way that can happen is when someone gets exposed to nicotine in a short period of time before you die. From the amount and whereabouts of the nicotine in Linda's samples, a picture was emerging of her final hours. The other thing we found is that nicotine levels in the urine were much, much lower than expected from nicotine levels in the blood, which means, again, she must have died before there was time for the nicotine to leave the bloodstream and get into the urine, which normally happens. So all of this points out or suggests that Linda Curry died um, within probably 20 or 30 minutes of the time she got nicotine. Investigators could prove nicotine killed Linda. But just how did the poison enter her body? During her autopsy, 
the pathologist spotted a tiny hemorrhage behind her right ear, identical to a needle entry point. High level of a drug called Zolpidem, which in the US is called Ambien. It's a sleeping pill. Linda Curry was not prescribed that. So it appears that she took or was given the Zolpidem, which then put her deeply asleep. And then someone, presumably Paul Curry, injected nicotine behind her ear. The Orange County investigators had another question for Dr. Benowitz. Where did the nicotine come from? We don't know exactly, but it's very easy to get a concentrated nicotine solution. Basically, you take a couple of cigarettes or several cigarettes, take them out of the paper, put them in hot water, make a tea out of them, filter out the tobacco leaves, and you have a pretty concentrated nicotine solution. So it's very easy to make a source of nicotine with which you could kill somebody. I was surprised. First, I was surprised at how volatile nicotine was. But secondly, if Paul Curry was as smart as everybody was saying he was, this is how he thinks he can get away with it. Very volatile poison, but a very easily accessible poison. When Sergeant Shell met Curry's ex-wife, she made a chilling discovery. She was sick for about a year prior to Paul leaving her. And they tried to get life insurance, but she was denied life insurance. But I talked to an underwriter from New York Life, and he told me, well, the reason that she probably got denied is that she was positive for nicotine on a blood test. Like Linda, Leslie was a non-smoker. Unlike Linda, her health improved after Paul left. By 2009, Sergeant Shell's team had tracked down Curry and planned a visit. My thought is that I would have a local investigator with me and myself, but I would introduce myself only by my middle name so that he would not know that I was from Orange County, that he would think I was from Kansas. So I gave the detective 20 questions and said, you ask these questions to start the interview and let him talk. I'm not going to say anything. When you finish with these 20 questions, turn the interview over to me and I'll start. The police chief of Salina, Kansas said, he's never going to talk to you. He's too smart. But he talked to me for two and a half hours. In those two and a half hours, a lifetime of lies began to unravel. I had him admit to me that he was untruthful about things in the investigation. He admitted to insurance fraud uh, because Linda had a Rolex watch, which Paul let the sister have the day after Linda's funeral, and he reported it as stolen and got insurance money for it. I caught him in lies of his education. In one interview, he said that he graduated from the University of California, Irvine. He never graduated from there and did not have a degree in physics. So he admitted to that. He admitted to the insurance fraud. So I caught him in several lies like that. It was finally time for Curry to be held accountable. He was smart, smart, but it was his demise. He thought he was so smart that he could say whatever. And then when you pin him down on things, he has to admit that he's wrong. Finally, in November 2010, Curry was arrested, charged with insurance fraud and murder. The Marathon case took another four years to go to trial. Well, one of the best moments was the defense attorney put on a nicotine expert. And the nicotine expert testified to a book that was written by Neil Benowitz. And we put Neil Benowitz on to refute their nicotine expert saying, you're using a book that's written by him. So that was great. 
um, because their expert was trained or using all of Neil Benowitz's information. And then Leslie Curry, the second slash third wife, came and testified. She talked about how she was sick for a year prior to life insurance being denied, and then she got better once Paul left, and she's never been sick since. Two decades after Linda's death, justice had caught up with Paul Curry. On Friday, 14th, November 2014, he was found guilty of first-degree murder. Well, Paul Curry's actions affected a lot of people, not only Linda's family, but prior boyfriends, her best friend, all of her co-workers at Edison. They were all affected by this. It's been a rough one. That Going through trial was rough for them. 20 years later, they're having to think about the loss that they had and are rehashing everything over and over again. But they're finally getting closure, and finally, Paul is having to pay for Linda. Years of perseverance paid off, serving a warning to others. If you're the suspect, always look over your shoulder, because someone is going to be out there looking for you. what became America's first known case of murder by insulin poisoning. Philandering Californian con artist, William Dale Archard, left a trail of dead wives and relations over the course of three decades. It's such a dark story because Archard killed the people he was closest to. He knew science couldn't catch him, and therefore the law couldn't catch him. Born in Arkansas in 1912, William Dale Archard came from a family of lawbreakers. When he was two, about 1914, his father had gotten involved with the, uh, some trouble with the law. He was saying goodbye to his young boy, and then no one in the family ever saw him again. His brother Everett, who, like William, eventually moved to California after drifting through the Midwest, also served time in jail. By 1940, Archard had been married for five years to Eleanor who'd trained as a nurse. Having borrowed her medical books, Archard passed the state examination to work at Camarillo State Mental Hospital. He was now able to pursue two of his interests, women and pharmaceutical drugs. He held a job as a nursing assistant in a mental facility in California, where he became familiar with patients who were undergoing insulin coma therapy for mental disease, which was common from about 1930 to about 1960. The idea was you made patients with severe mental illness comatose with insulin. You left them for an hour or so, and then you brought them round. It didn't work, but it was thought to work. As a result of that, Archer knew that insulin could cause you to go into coma and die. He became fascinated with insulin. He was able to talk his coworkers into letting him inject them with insulin to test how it worked on the body. The other nurses and the other orderlies all went to him with questions rather than the doctors. Archer had aspirations to be a doctor. He even claimed he had gone to medical school, uh, but did not graduate, you know, and people believed it. He had wives that believed it. But Archard lied. Rather than forging a career in medicine, he chose to forge insurance claims with the help of insulin. 
Insulin is an essential part of our lives and it controls the concentration of glucose or sugar in the blood, which is terribly important because it's the fuel that the brain relies on. It's very, very, very potent. Administering insulin to someone unnecessarily can cause their blood sugar levels to drop and keep on dropping. And if it falls too low, the brain stops working. Starts off by misbehaving and making us feel unwell and feeling shaky and sweating and blurred vision and so on. If it carries on, we go into coma. And if that's not relieved by somebody giving us some sugar, we die. Life changing for diabetics. Archard cynically mastered insulin's effects to craft life-taking scams. A lot of his sort of scams that he was running, he would talk his cohorts into letting him inject them uh, with insulin in order to fake a head injury. 34-year-old William Edward Jones Jr. became the first to be fixed. It was 1947 when he first used insulin to kill what was a sort of business partner, but it wasn't suspected at the time. Archard proposed staging a car accident to Jones, who was on bail, having been charged with molesting a young girl. The plan was to pay off the child's family with funds from the insurance claim on the traffic accident. On the night of October the 10th, 1947, police found Jones in a wrecked car. Complaining of a headache, he was taken to hospital, where Archard visited him. And then he would go back, usually once they're in the hospital, come back in at night and overdose them so they would die. Hospital tests showed Jones's blood pressure and sugar levels were low. Despite receiving doses of glucose, he became comatose. By October 12th, he was convulsing and was in respiratory distress. By 11 a.m. that morning, he was dead. His cause of death, undetermined. In 1950, Californian law caught up with Archard, but not for murder. In 1950, uh, William Archard was actually found to be in possession of morphine and actually sent to a minimum security prison in California. It would seem that in about 1951, William got tired of the accommodations there and he escaped. Uh, and upon capturing William, the authorities uh, in California sent him to one of the most notorious prisons in the United States at that time, San Quentin. In 1956, a few years after his release, Archard divorced Dorothea. The day after the official annulment, Archard was in Las Vegas, marrying 48-year-old homeowner, Zella Winders. Their married life together would last a mere 10 weeks. On the 24th of July, 1956, Archard convinced Zella to receive an injection. The story that he reported to the police was that he and his wife were undergoing a burglary. Sacks were put over their heads so they couldn't see what was going on. They were both injected with substances, which he didn't know about. And when the burglars left, he managed to escape, took his hood off, phoned the police and told them about the burglary. His wife confirmed his story. The police thought that this was a bit strange. Neither of them was seen to be suffering very badly. Zella's fortunes, however, 
changed dramatically over the next 24 hours. The wife became poorly, went into coma and died at home. He said she refused to go to hospital. No cause for her death was found at post-mortem, but they did notice that there were some puncture wounds in her bottom. Sergeant Harry Andre found a vial of insulin at their home. But no method for forensically measuring insulin in a body was readily accessible at the time. They just thought that something strange had happened. They investigated it as far as they could, but they didn't get any further. Archard moved to Las Vegas. By 1958, he had targeted another would-be wife for a payout. One of his wives he had murdered and actually died in Nevada, had an estate of roughly $40,000 and left him a token $1. Her name was Juanita Plum. He wooed her for several months, even convincing her to let him move in. But having wed on March the 10th, 1958, Juanita was in a coma two days later. She was pronounced dead on March the 13th. Five months later, the practiced womanizer clocked up another Vegas wedding. Archer was married to my great-grandmother, Gladys, and I grew up with her being my great-grandma Arden, though I never knew where the Arden came from. She had married him under the alias James Lynn Arden in 1958, and then remarried him in 1959 under William Dale Archard, and then remained married until 65. He did have seven wives and numerous girlfriends besides the wife. So given that he was a professional con man, if you will, I'm thinking he wanted to free up the alias to do other things. Gladys was also a divorcee, with three children from her previous marriage to Frank Stewart. Returning to Los Angeles, Archard became an attentive stepfather to Gladys's daughters. People often told him he was so kindly in the way that he presented himself that uh, he reminded them of a preacher. You know, he seemed very, um, very approachable, very, you know, concerned about others. He was, particularly with their father, Frank, whom he'd struck up a business relationship. He had talked Frank Stewart, uh, their father, into running an insurance scam in McCarran Airport in Las Vegas, Nevada. And the way the scam was supposed to work was Frank was going to slip and fall, reportedly, uh, on a banana peel in a bathroom at McCarran Airport. Archer told a friend later on that Frank was too stupid and too much of a coward to actually take the fall himself. Archer said that he, in fact, uh, faked the fall in the airport and then transported themselves to the hospital uh, where Frank claimed to have been the one that fell. It's assumed at this point that Frank had been injected with some degree of insulin in order to mimic the head injury. While they were in Las Vegas, Archard had another woman drive his car from California to Las Vegas. Transporting him syringes and insulin in a small package that he had put in the trunk of his own car. Uh, he had told her not to look in it, but simply bring this package to me when I need it in Las Vegas. And that's what he used to murder Frank that night. Frank died on March 17, 1960. No one thought to investigate Frank's unexpected coma further, in spite of forensic advances. There was a little bit of a cash payout from insurance, life insurance, to the daughters. They proceeded from the point that, believing that this was an accident, believing that William Archard was a good man who was involved with their mother, I'm guessing the fact that my great-grandmother was never paid in Frank's death by the insurance company um, is also a reason why she wasn't killed. Archard was becoming prolific, 
that he was about to sink to new depths. Archard's mother, Jenny May, brother Everett and nephew Bernie lived in Long Beach. Everett worked here in Long Beach, down at the docks. He was a longshoreman. He died, I believe, in 1961. It was reported as a work-related death. But reporters I've spoken to from the time, as well as other writers, believed that it's very likely Archer had killed him as well. Everett had actually warned one of uh, William Dale Archer's soon-to-be brides not to get involved with him, that he was a charlatan and a dangerous man, and that that's why Archer killed his brother. Everett's 15-year-old son, Bernie, was now an orphan. The $8,000 he received in compensation was held in trust. His uncle, William, and his grandmother, Jenny May, became trustees. It's my understanding that all of the amount, that about 1500 went into a bank account that Jenny May was a part of, the rest of it, uh, William Archer had taken and spent. That summer, Bernie wrecked his bicycle while riding around Long Beach. His uncle, William, had an idea. How about we say that there was a hit and run? Um, we'll say that a panel van, a work truck, had sideswiped you, had knocked you down. We'll say you have a head injury and I'll take you to the hospital. When Bernie was admitted to hospital, his dilated pupils mimicked the symptoms of a head injury. So he's admitted and seems to be doing fine about 6 p.m. You know, Bernie's sitting up, he's eating, he's talking. But by midnight, Bernie's vitals were crashing. His uncle, however, had already left the hospital to visit his mother, Jenny May. I suspect, rather than having to explain that Bernie's in the hospital and he's going to kill him, uh, he just chose to kill his own mother and have her cremated the following day. His mother was not important to him. He easily killed her. In less than a year, Bernie was orphaned and had now lost his grandmother. When local newspapers were covering this, you know, they talked about this poor boy whose grandmother had just passed away, whose father had died a year earlier, who didn't know his own mother, uh, only had this kind uncle there. When asked how Bernie was going to do, or it looked like the prognosis was going to be, uh, William Archard stated flatly, he's not expected to survive. Archard would make sure he didn't, in a slow, dreadful manner. The medical staff was operating under the assumption he had a head injury. Uh, they had called Archard late at night after the first night uh, and said, we need you to come down and sign some authorization papers. We want to drill holes in his skull to try to alleviate what we believe to be a brain bleed and pressure inside his head. Archard, knowing full well that that was not the case, said absolutely and signed the waiver permitting them to drill holes in Bernie's skull, uh, which to their surprise showed no brain bleed and no pressure in the skull whatsoever. Bernie spent the next 13 days in hospital. While medical staff tried to resolve the symptoms of a bogus head injury, Archard plowed shots of insulin into his young nephew. My great-grandmother, Gladys, was in the hospital with Archard when he was visiting Bernie. When she was leaving the hospital, he looked at her and said, you know, uh, Auntie Gladys, uh, won't you give me a, a hug and a kiss goodbye before you go? Uh, and she didn't want to because his sheets were wet from perspiring. He was very sweaty. She didn't really want to hug him and give him a kiss goodbye. Bernie was showing all the signs of a hypoglycemia attack. On September 2nd, 1961, Bernie died. He almost certainly killed his nephew because he was responsible for looking after his fortune left to, a relatively small fortune, left to him by his father. The cause of death was blamed on the traffic incident, which brought the case to the attention of Sergeant White, a homicide detective 
who investigated road fatalities. Sergeant White had proved Archard had staged a separate traffic accident to make a fraudulent insurance claim. Following Bernie's death, Archard was on Sergeant White's radar. In 1965, William identified his final target. He divorced Gladys, went on and married another woman and murdered her uh, whilst maintaining a relationship with my great-grandmother. The seventh woman Archard married was the romantic novelist Mary Brinker Post. But 18 months in their marriage, Mary declared bankruptcy and the couple separated. On October the 28th, 1965, Mary was in a traffic accident, leaving her bruised and shaken. She had kept in touch with William, who dropped by on November the 1st. The next morning, Mary was rushed to Pomona Valley Hospital. She was in a coma. On November the 3rd, Mary was pronounced dead. The cause of death was hypoglycemia. Yet she hadn't received any insulin at the hospital. And it was only really that when she died and it came to the attention of the same police officer, Harold White, that the penny dropped, that this was the same man and they consulted various people who said, yes, the symptoms that you described could have been due to insulin. And they eventually found a pathologist who said he could measure insulin. And he said that he found insulin in the brain in large amounts. William Dale Archard was arrested by Sergeant Harold White on July the 27th, 1967, charged with the murders of Zella his nephew Bernie, and seventh wife Mary. An enormous amount of detective work had gone on linking Archard with these other deaths. And by pure detective work, it all turned out that they all could have died from low blood sugar. They could have been poisoned by insulin. On Monday, December the 4th, 1967, the murder trial began at Los Angeles Superior Court. It would last for eight months. Archard pleaded not guilty. The amount of people, of ex-wives, of ex-girlfriends, of, you know, they called in roughly, you know, four to five dozen medical personnel, people who had worked with him. Ryan's great aunt struggled to understand Archard's crimes. I don't know that anyone can come to terms with their parent being murdered, you know, especially when at the time she thought it was uh, natural causes. Archard was found guilty. On Monday, March the 18th, 1968, Judge Adolf Alexander handed down the sentence. Death by the gas chamber. 55-year-old Archard was returning to San Quentin prison again, but this time he was heading to death row. Archard had made a comment to a person at one time that said, uh, you know, everybody he killed deserved it, especially since many of them allowed him to inject them, inject them with insulin willingly as part of his scams. Uh, he felt they were too stupid to deserve to live. Archer died in 1977, aged 65. Decades later, the reverberations of Archer's crimes continue to haunt his stepdaughter. 
that it was something at this point in her life uh, she still hadn't dealt with. She said, this is the man who murdered my father, a man who at the time, again, she described as kindly, church-going, really good to her and her family. And throughout the, you know, 50-plus years since then, it's something that she just hadn't come to terms with yet.